from Wana Brands. Welcome to Enhance Your Life. I'm your host, Jonathan Small, and each week I talk to people from all sorts of professions and backgrounds about how cannabis has enhanced their lives and how this healing plant can enrich your life too. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Enhance Your Life podcast. My name is John Small, and I am your host. I am delighted to bring you my guest today, Jerry Whiting joins us, and Jerry is the co-founder and president of LeBlanc CNE, which specializes in hemp genetics, product development, research, and education. He is a longtime cannabis activist and educator, has a great backstory. Uh, Jerry also writes a monthly column on hemp for Northwest Leaf, and he co-hosts the Hemp Kite podcast. He is a frequent speaker at Seattle Hemp Fest, CannaCon, etc., and, and while black people make up only 12% of the population, black farmers are a mere 1.4%. God only knows how many black hemp farmers there are. Makes Jerry, <laughs> <laughs> Jerry a, a very special person indeed. And uh, Jerry, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, John. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm uh, part of a very small uh, demographic sliver of... Uh, Eventually, of people of color growing hemp, uh, it's not as uh, diverse as I'd like it to be, but mm. there's a lot of geopolitical factors that skew it away from, especially black farmers in the South. Interesting. Well, let's talk about how you got into it, because it's not, one might not think that this would be your background that would lead to this kind of a livelihood. So tell us about what you were doing and then why you decided to turn to becoming a hemp farmer. So I'm coming up on 68, so I'm an old guy, I'm a boomer, and I've been using cannabis recreationally with Vim and Vigor since I was 15. But in terms of my profession, I spent the bulk of my life working in software. I had three kids, all boys. The older two developed seizures when they entered adolescence. Mm. And middle son, Coleman, approached me about 10 years ago and asked for help transitioning from big pharma and its side effects the cannabis. And he knew that I was a cannabis user. And I also, before software, practiced massage and acupuncture back in Boston many, many years ago. Long story short, I'm a longtime friend of Martin A. Lee, head of Project CBD. And Marty stays with us during, or used to, Hemp Fest has been off for a couple of years. Marty used to stay with our family during Hemp Fest. I said, Coleman, I don't know much about it, but Marty's going to be here in a couple of weeks. Yes, he was, spent six days with us. And by the end of it, I knew a heck of a lot about medical marijuana, cannabis, and CBD. So Coleman and I began to look for solutions for him, and that involved identifying plants that were CBD positive, beginning to grow those and do extractions. And I had a leg up because in my misspent youth, I used to do recreational extractions of cannabinoids, mm. being the nerd that I am. So we fast forward. Unfortunately, Coleman died during a seizure five years ago. I'm so sorry. Uh, with big shoes to fill. So I mentioned I had been a software nerd for years. I had my own company, which Miranda and I sold two years ago. Her wish list was to have her own coffee house. She has a wonderful one in Bremerton, Washington. My wish was to become a hemp guy. And so hemp in many ways is more liberated legally than cannabis after the farm bill. And I've been growing it and making medicine. And now I'm working with a paper maker and doing all sorts of exotic stuff. But I love the plant. I have a huge seed bank. I've learned the science pretty well. And nothing after 30 plus years with a keyboard and a mouse, I have a pickup truck and a shovel. <laughs> That's <wonderful. laughs> Well, for those who don't know a lot about hemp and cannabis, Let's talk about the differences, because I think people don't quite understand the difference between hemp and cannabis. Could you explain that to us? So our favorite plant, Cannabis Sativa L, is artificially divided in legal terms by the amount of THC. And so if the plant has less than 0.3% Delta-9 THC, that which gets us stoned, it is not a Schedule One controlled substance. It is a legal crop after the Farm Bill in 2018. If it has enough, well, 0.3 isn't enough to get you high, but there's this artificial distinction between poodles and German shepherds, between sweet corn and popcorn. Let's face it, they're all the same genetically, but for legal reasons, if it has too much THC, it's 
fat, if it has a small amount of THC, it's okay. So it is the same plant. You can cross pollinate just like German shepherds and collies. But in terms of a farmer, you have to have a license to grow either one. And you can have a dual license, but really people have segregated into being either a pot farmer, getting people stoned, or being a hemp farmer, getting people well, or making food or paper or a lot of other products. Right. And why did you choose hemp instead of the THC, more THC prevalent, you know, what we call cannabis? Oh, because the laws legalizing either recreational or medical marijuana are state by state specific. And it is federally illegal to transport cannabis from one state to another. With few restrictions, places like Idaho that doesn't recognize hemp, you can move hemp not only from state to state, but in many cases internationally. So the short answer is I can still make effective medicine for people without going to prison. Hmm. Well, that's that's a good thing. It, you know, it's on the plus side. You know, it's, <laughs> yes. So, so, yeah, it's a lot freer. And the other thing that I discovered here in Washington state, cannabis is regulated by the Liquor and Cannabis Board. Not my best friend. In every state, hemp is administered by the Department of Agriculture. And I've spoken with the Department of Ag people in Washington, Oregon, New Mexico, Wisconsin, other places. All of them want their farmers to not only survive, but to prosper. So your Department of Ag person is theoretically on your side, cheerleading and helping you succeed. Not necessarily so with pot. And the excise tax issue is a, is a drag. And the income tax thing with 280E, you can't take standard deductions if you're a pot farmer, even though it's quasi-legal. Banking, there's a whole lot of roadblocks for cannabis, though we all know it has its place because many of us believe that any use, cannabis, hemp, or anything in between, is all medicinal. Let me ask you about the medicinal use. Hemp obviously works as medicine. And it does it have, I guess, does it have enough THC to have that balance, that medicinal property? You know, this is a, thank you for bringing this up. Okay, because it comes up a lot. It does. And the simple answer is everything in the plant works together synergetically, in what's called the entourage effect. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Ethan Russo, a uh, wonderful scientist, lives here in Seattle, greater Seattle area, has this paper where he talks about in the presence of THC, CBD is two and a half to three times as effective and vice versa. So they all work together synergetically. And so in my humble opinion, hemp makes good medicine. It would be better if it had more THC. And there are some conditions like cancer where it's been reported that people have better results with THC centric preparations as opposed to CBD hemp preparations. In the end, we have receptors in our body, the CB1 and CB2 receptors that comprise the endocannabinoid system. In the end, anytime we stimulate or activate our endocannabinoid system, it acts to restore health and balance in the body. Is hemp good medicine? Yes. Would it be better if it had more THC? In many cases, definitely so. But we need to keep our endocannabinoid system, like other things, in good working order. And if hemp is what you have access to and it's safe and it's organically grown and it's not full of heavy metals or contamination, by all means, that's medicine. Now, you mentioned your son, Coleman. I'm so sorry for your loss. And he passed away, I think you, I read, because of epilepsy, because of seizures from epilepsy? Yes, he died during a seizure. Wow. Was he taking the medicine at that time? He was doing, actually, ironically, he had just left an uneventful one-hour regularly scheduled appointment with his neurologist. Hmm. Got in the car, started it up, and didn't get past that first block. So how does his loss sort of motivate you going forward? It, it obviously had a, a massive impact on your life. And talk to me about how it's motivated you both in your life and, and, and your work, if you don't mind me asking. Oh, no. It is part of the oral history 
of the cannabis community, not just here in Seattle, but in a much larger part of the world. It definitely was the most profound event in my life. Thank God for the Canna family. My sisters and brothers in the, in the industry, they said, hey, look, we're all mourning the loss of one of our own. And people rallied around me, especially the men who were there, not just for the first week or for the first month, but periodically they would check in. Jerry, how are you doing? No, really, you can be honest with me. It motivates me in that I find a lot of parents bring their children who have autism, seizures, and other disorders. Knowing my story, first thing they say is, I'm really sorry about Coleman. What can you do for my child? Mm. And that, I mean, I love kids. I absolutely <laughs> positively love kids. And so it's a pleasure working with them. And quite honestly, these families have conversations with me that are to the point and very honest. And there's this level of comfort, it's what I call the, the painful club. Parents who've buried children, no one has a kid to put them in the ground, but it definitely motivates me to be the best processor that I can making medicine. I'm a practicing Buddhist. And so the Canada family helped me put some of Coleman's ashes out to sea as a group exercise. And it, it really, I mean, I'm never gonna do anything else. You know, this is what I'm gonna do as long as I'm here. And it's my pleasure, and it's the reason I get out of bed in the morning. Yeah, you know? it's beautiful. Well, it's wonderful that you had that community to support you. And, and I do find that the Canna, you say the Canna family, is that just the, the, the industry in general, your, your friends within? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, no, not everyone in the industry is family, but there are people who, we're there for each other. I know I've traveled around the country a bit. It's strong here in Cascadia, in Washington and Oregon, because we all know each other. Some of us have been friends for year and business associates for years now, and we cross paths in in many ways. It really is a family, you know, yeah. and we treat it as such. And it's really great because you know part of the 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 bummer of the lockdown for coronavirus has been I don't get to see these folks and I don't get to hug them and to hang out and laugh and share more than just work. And again. If it wasn't for the Canada family, I'd be a puddle on the floor. Mm. So this show is called Enhance Your Life. And the idea is, you know, that the cannabis has enhanced the lives of so many people. And yes. talk to me about cannabis in your own life, when you first discovered it, how it's enhanced your life, obviously through the hemp, the growing of hemp, that is that is one part of it. But in terms of your own personal life, how you use it as a, as a you know, as medicine, as recreation. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk to us about that? So it was the mid late sixties when I first discovered drugs of all kind. I actually tripped before I got stoned. <laughs> you know, I don't microdose. People give me mushrooms, but I I've done it with my homeboys on Rainier three times since I've been here, which dates back to 1986. So I'm not I don't have any problem with it. I think it's wonderful that people are exploring their consciousness. For me, it's always been medicinal. It relieves stress. I feel good. I think I'm happier. I'm not running from my problems. Yeah, DOCs, drugs of choice. For me, it's beer, caffeine, cannabis. I live in Seattle. I'm a complete beer nerd. I hate getting drunk, but hops, 75% of the hops in the U.S. was grown in Yakima County. The beer here is off the charts. And chai is, you know, before coffee, though coffee is ubiquitous in Seattle. But I love plants. And part of it is I became vegetarian in like 1970, 1971. So I've led this plant-based life. My uncle taught me how to garden and compost at the same time when I was in second grade. And hmm. I've been this outdoor guy. It's interesting. This outdoor guy ended up uh, being a computer programmer, but then you found your calling right? I know, later that's in your life. Long story. Yeah. <laughs> but you fun. know, I really, you know, I, I have community gardens. I've had them in, heck, in Ann Arbor, in Boston, now in Seattle, I'm setting up, I've been invited to set up a garden behind an elementary school in Shoreline here. And yeah, I'm one of those guys who likes to wander in the Cascades with, you know, ultralight off trail GPS, you know, listen to marmots whistle and mm -hmm. yeah. I read that you, that you don't like the word marijuana. Is it because of the sort of the racist history of, of it? Yeah. So Anslinger in the thirties, he wanted to demonize cannabis and so by associating it with Mexican-Americans using the slang term, he made it a racist thing. And this is during the age of 
jazz being called race records, you know? I mm. mean, this is a highly segregated time in American history. So some of us use the term cannabis for the drug cultivar and hemp for the rest of it. It's somewhat confusing because they're all cannabis sativa L cultivars, but I language is powerful mm. and words have connotation meaning and often carry baggage. And if nothing else, it gives me the opportunity to highlight the fact that the war on drugs has always been racist, beginning with Anslinger and using the term marijuana, uh, Richard Nixon using it as a political tool against the anti-war movement and specifically the Black uh, Panthers, and stop and frisk. There are a lot of times when it's been used as a pretext for a pretense for profiling and harassing, imprisoning people of color, gay people, disadvantaged communities unfairly compared to European Americans and those with wealth and, and access to power. So the opportunity to even briefly mention the, the racist connotation of marijuana hopefully nudges people to put cannabis in context, much as Marty did in um, Smoke Signals, The Social History of Marijuana, I think it's believed, mm. uh, Martin A. Lee. It talks about the cultural aspect, not just a botanical or psychedelic. For example, I mentioned people of color in the South. I'm trying to work with black farmers in Dixie, below the Mason-Dixon. Well, yes, the soil's different. Yes, the daylight period is different. But the real difference is you have to drive one or two states away if you're in Dixie to find legal pot. So it's all underground, mm. which means you don't have any influence growing it casually. I haven't even seen the plan. And there's this this mentality, I remember when it le was legalized here in Washington State, it took me about 10 months before it really sunk in, hey, I don't have to hide this anymore. I don't have to be ashamed. I don't have to be afraid. I can talk about it without whispering in public. It's yeah. no longer taboo. But in the South, life is different. You know, it's not, it's what I call unliberated territory. There is no hemp fest there. You can't do it in public, and therefore the the water cooler conversations about the science don't happen. The casual nature of seeing it growing in someone's yard or on a farm somewhere doesn't exist. When I go home to Ohio, it's been decriminalized. 15 grams is a $125 fine. 25 grams is a $250 fine. No ticket, no jail time, not a misdemeanor which says to me that an old stoner, so a lid is 125 bucks and an ounce is 250. Shit, I carried that in my wallet when I, officer, pull me over. First of all, I'm older than your parents. Second of all, I have the money in my wallet for the fine for, for, for 15 grams of cannabis. I'm only here a few days. That's all I need. Fuck you and fuck your laws. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you have to throw tea in the harbor in order to liberate yourself, but that hasn't happened in large parts of the country yet. It will, because I see the day coming soon when cannabis is legal and hemp is already. And so the whole thing, you know, cannabis sativa L, it might have state specific restrictions or licenses, but you could drive from one place to the other. You know, you're not gonna get busted right. because labels has a, a tax stamp, if you will, or a identifier UBI number here in Washington that says, oh, it's from the Evergreen State. Oh, but you're in Nevada. You're in Kentucky. You're in whatever. You know, it is so artificial. Oh, it's so crazy. And that's that's because we're not legal nationally. That's because cannabis is not. <laughs> that, that'll happen. You know, yeah. there's too many Americans who've done it. There are too many patients who've gotten well and are thriving because of it. And it's not just Charlotte Figgy. And there, that tipping point, and the VA recognizes colloquially, or at least, you know, de facto, that cannabis helps vets with PTSD. I don't care about any other thing. When, when the, the VA knows it, you know, it, that, that's another huge issue, especially having been shamed out of Afghanistan. Those people who serve there feel betrayed. That's only going to trigger things for them. Cannabis helps short-term memory stuff, PTSD. I I've worked with vets. I know for a fact it is not recreational. It is not escapism. It's therapeutic. 
so that's for the consumer. Also, the business, as we mentioned in the beginning of this interview, there aren't a lot of black farmers in this country, and there's certainly not a lot of people of color who grow hemp um, no. in the North or the South. Why do you think that is? Well, you know, I've, I've been working with, with some for a couple years now. First of all, culturally, it's a family decision. Some of these black farmers have owned the land for two, three, four generations, but the grandparents are still alive and the elders have a say at the table as well. And what I have found, the younger the members of these families are, the more cannabis and hemp friendly they are. They have direct experience. They didn't grow up with that onerous prison hanging over their head and they've traveled to Colorado, Oregon, California, wherever, and experience legal recreational stores. It's an eye-opener when tourists come to Seattle and I take them to their first pot shop, <laughs> go crazy. Yeah, they you can't know? believe it's it. Like, so that's part of it. You know, I've worked, I'm talking with farmers in Alabama and, and the Carolinas and Georgia, Florida. There is a, and I'm a black man, so I can say this. There's this this post-slave mindset and the power shift between their neighbors and them. And I always say, hey, look, I say fiber is the way to go. I've got a spreadsheet to back it up. It's what I'm doing. Read my column. And as the last thing I say, if you do fiber right, you will earn more than the white farmer next door growing cotton. And the phone gets quiet. Mm. And it's true. But there's what I call geocultural issues that are brought to bear. For example, in some of these families, not only the elders, they, the, 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 all the cousins and grandkids own land, sometimes across several states, which they have for generations. Some of those people are not only church-going Christians, but they're pastors in their community. So grandpa is also the minister at church and has all of this sway. And if grandpa ain't down with it, it ain't going to happen. Mm. I haven't given up. It was going to be easier for me to convince black farmers all over the country to switch to fiber using hemp than it will be for me to convince anybody growing wheat, corn, soybeans in the grain belt in the middle of the country that's unvaxxed and Trump supporters and think January 6th was great and this, that, and the other. Those, that's the real hard nut to crack is for me to go out and evangelize uh, and say, hey, look, you're in debt. Farm suicides are off the hook. Nobody wants to talk about it. And you're not making any money. And you're being outspent and outsold by these big ag people who are not your friends, whether it's their GMO seeds or their Roundup or whatnot. If you want to be a family farm, you're fighting several uphill battles on several fronts at once. You don't need government programs. The seeds aren't that much. You start small, work with your neighbors, and work as a co-op. There's money to be made growing hemp the right way in the U.S. There's money to be made growing hemp. And the sooner people figure it out, the better off we'll all be. Not to mention the fact that if a portion of paper made is not from trees but from hemp, if you eat granola with hemp in it or drink hemp milk, that's coming from Canada. It's not grown in the U.S. of A. Mm. So there's a whole lot of potential, and it could be that I go into Trump territory in the Grain Belt and pitch it as a red, white, and blue thing and say, you know, the Chinese are the 800-pound gorilla. They, they dominate the hemp market worldwide. I love Canadians, but they're growing what we're eating, and we should do it on this side of the border and if I have to, I used to play the flute. If I have to play the piccolo and get John of Sousa to rouse these people in the middle of the country, so be it. Because the plant is bigger than the divide between any one issue between Trumpsters and myself. You may hate me, but you're going to love the m money you make if you, if you grow the crop the right way. It's interesting because you also, I, I, I read an article that you wrote called Stop Growing Hemp. So yes. in one way you're asking, you're saying it's time to grow, but you, you had a different reason just to clarify here. There's, there, you're talking about two different things here, right? You were talking about yes. stop growing hemp for CBD or explain yes. it to me. Yeah. Because the CBD market is, 
it's imbalanced. I'm not saying that people grew too much, but the supply demand thing is is not matched up. And the downside is is that farmers are losing because the prices for everything, be it biomass through isolate and distillate, have just plummeted every year for the last three years. And so that that miracle crop that used to earn forty thousand an acre in Colorado several years ago is totally off the charts now. It's off the table, I should say. So people need to be realistic. And, you know, I was with a couple of board members for Seattle Hemp Fest this weekend, helping harvest this hemp crop. And we were talking about returning to the original rallying cry of hemp activists everywhere, which was food, fuel, and fiber. And those potentials still exist. Now, thank goodness for Sanjay Gupta shining a light on CBD and its benefit for patients, but really we've lost sight of what I think is the real potential for hemp. And that is every coffee house up to and including Starbucks offers non-dairy milk alternatives. I don't see hemp on the menu at Starbucks. We all know that the Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat prove that Americans will put bacon on anything between two pieces of bread and an order of fries, whether it's from a cow or not. And McDonald's hasn't stepped in and done their thing yet, but they too have a plant-based burger coming out. Why aren't at least some of those burgers, you know, 20% hemp, the rest pea protein or whatever else they're doing? A lot of it's kind of bizarre, but hemp is good to eat and it's good for you. But Americans are importing what little we do eat. That Mm. ain't right. Yeah, that seems crazy. Well, this has been very enlightening. Jerry, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. If people want to find out more about you and about your company, where, where should they go? So we have a website, leblanccne.com. That's L-E-E-L-A-N-C-C-N-C. Why? Leblanc is whiting, my last name in French. And CNE, the business model, Cannabis Negociant Eleve. I based it on what grower brokers do in Bordeaux. And yes, I'm a Francophile. Um, I, I have never been to France, but I, I get it. I studied seven years of French in school. So leblancini.com, we have a series we're doing called From Seed to Paper, where a childhood friend and I are growing hemp in New Mexico, and he's making paper with the hemp that we grow. And yeah, you know, I'm around. I'm easy to find and hard to shut up. <laughs> well, you, I, I enjoyed listening to you talk. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. My pleasure. My pleasure indeed. Enhance Your Life is brought to you by WANA, the number one infused product in North America. WANA's entire process is designed to deliver the same great experience time after time. They have spent years fine-tuning their recipes so that their products are delicious, consistent, and potent. For more information, head on over to WANABrands.com. That's WANA, W-A-N-A, brands.com